everybody. Welcome back to Crime Weekly. I'm Stephanie Harlow. And I'm Derek Levasseur. Today we are finishing up the Robin Pulp case. So this is part two of a two-part series. There's not going to be any more after this, but we are going to wrap it up here. We're going to go over a couple more factors or features of the case. We also have an interview with somebody who was on the case firsthand. Why don't you introduce him, Derek? Yeah, Sergeant David Sexton. We kind of teased it last week. We actually did the interview earlier this week, so we didn't want to cram all this in into one episode and make it like a three-hour episode. So we really wanted to take time on certain parts of this case and then get David Sexton's opinion on those things so that we could have a full understanding of the case directly from the horse's mouth before, you know, spitting out some theories. Yeah. And I, I really, I really enjoyed the interview with him because I had a list of questions that I wanted to ask him as I was going through this case. So I was able to kind of get those answered. We were able to clear up things with the timeline because we were kind of going through the gigs with the timeline in part one. You guys didn't see it, but there was about 45 minutes of discussion <laughs> where yeah. we had to go back and forth with different time zones and Oh, it was it, it took a much longer time last week to record the episode than usual, but I'm glad we did because now I feel like it's just emblazoned in my mind and I cannot forget it. And then talking to um, Sexton really brought that to life for me. So I think you guys are really going to enjoy hearing his perspective on this case. And remember, he was there. He talked to Wayne Pope. He interviewed Wayne Pope when you saw or heard uh, that little portion of Wayne Pope's interview where somebody was saying, like, you killed your wife. That was Sergeant Sexton. So he's yeah. a badass. He's good at what he does. He knows what he's doing. I liked him a lot. Yeah, he's a good dude. And I, I was kind of praising him before you got a chance to meet him. But you can see he is really a genuine guy and he is good at what he does. And there are departments where we talk about how they're not really experienced and they don't get a lot of this type of crime. Maryland State Police is it's the state police. I mean, they're 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 overseeing the local police officers in the state of Maryland. So they're Sergeant Sexton was telling me he's actually in charge of all police involved shootings in the state. Now that's what his unit's doing. So they are the best of the best in the state of Maryland. And I really appreciated his willingness to come on, be candid with us. We'll talk more about it afterwards, but he was very transparent. He's a busy guy. He had just worked the case for 27 hours and he's still the, the lead detective on this case. So if anything comes from this, whether it's one of our listeners or one of our viewers, you're going to have a direct connection to him. We'll be giving his information out in the actual interview. Yeah. And I think even more than that, he he genuinely cares about Robin Pope and, and solving her case. You can tell from talking to him. You know, I don't want to say it's personal because I, I don't think that he would lose professional courtesy or distance like like that. But he clearly does care about Robin and he cares about seeing this this case find justice. So hopefully it does. Absolutely. Yeah. He's one of those guys where, like you said, it's all the cases that are unsolved. And even I remember doing a case in Seattle where, you know, the guy told you every unsolved case you have, it stays with you. He actually was tearing up in the episode where it's like, you know, it's uh, it's one of those things where it takes a piece of you. Everyone that you go to bed at night knowing there's this, there's, there's no answers yet. So um, you can see that with Dave and, and he's had an ability to still put his best foot forward. And I, I can't wait for you guys to hear what he had to say. So I want to talk about what happened after the autopsy. Robin's body was released to her next of kin. Now, that would be her husband, Wayne Pope. So when I heard about this part of the case, I was like, this is so bad. You know, I don't think that if it's potentially a suspicion that the spouse could have said, could have had something to do with their wife or their husband's death, I don't think that they should be considered next of kin. Like, I think that there should be some sort of holding pattern or some sort of like secondary next of kin that way, you know, because what happened after he got her body was he had her cremated, right? Almost immediately. Almost immediately, just within a few days. So yep. what we have here is if there's there's any sort of, I mean, we, they did do the autopsy and they didn't find anything because of how long she'd been in the water because of how um, badly decomposed her body was. However, we don't know with, you know, technology or with a different pathologist or something like that. If she'd been exhumed at a later date, they maybe could have found something. So if Wayne Pope had anything to do with what happened to Robin, he essentially ensured that there would never be evidence of that when, when he had her body cremated. And I'm not saying he did. What I'm saying is if he did, that's what he did. <laughs> so. Yeah. And, and to play devil's advocate, if I were support, if I was a Wayne Pope supporter, which I'm not, I think that's very obvious, <laughs> I would I would say, listen... You know, everything you said is right, Stephanie. Technology down the road may have helped it, but 
let's all be let's all be honest with each other here for a second. It doesn't take a detective or an oceanographer or whatever to know her body was in a really bad condition when it was found, and there's no way you could have a traditional wake with her body being in that condition. So if there were no suspicious circumstances surrounding this case, surrounding Wayne, I think most people would be like, yeah, no, I get why you would have a cremation because of the circumstances surrounding it. But it doesn't make you feel better knowing that the person who's making that decision because of the law, the way it's written, um, is, is someone who is probably one of the only persons of interest right now. And he's deciding what happens with basically one of the few pieces of evidence in this case. It just doesn't sit well with anybody who who wants answers for Robin and her family. <laughs> he's deciding what happens with one of the few pieces of evidence in this case. He's deciding what happens with the body of a woman who could potentially have been his victim. You know, and imagine exactly. how you feel. Right. Imagine how you'd feel if you're if you're Robin's daughters and this decision is, is in this person's hands. And yeah. you heavily it, suspect that he may have had something to do with her death. It's just a very, very uncomfortable situation. Yep. Tough pill to swallow. I, I do think based on what Dave told us both, some of it he said directly, some of it you, you can kind of infer without saying it, that again, based on technology available today, which is pretty damn good, um, it will always get better, obviously. But based on what we have today, they couldn't even determine cause of death, manner of death. Again, body, water, 23 days. You guys do the math. It's It's not a pretty picture as far as, you know, what you're left with and the condition of the skin when you get it. But that's the way it falls sometimes. And he was, like you said, he was very disappointed. Again, you'll hear it in the interview when he, they finally did the autopsy because of these circumstances. So Wayne Pope actually was going to take a polygraph. What happened was the Queen Anne County's state's attorney, Lance Richardson, he kind of offered Wayne Pope a deal. He was like, listen, um, you know, we're going to give you a polygraph. and." During this polygraph, I'm going to ask you directly whether or not you killed your wife. And if the results come back and they say that there was no deception, like AKA you didn't lie, then I'm going to release that information to the public. And this will help you look more innocent in the court of public opinion. Because at this point, obviously, there's a lot of talk, especially around the small town, that maybe Wayne Pope's involved. And so this will help you clear your name amongst your community members, your neighbors, your friends, your family, et cetera. But if it comes back and it shows that you lied when answering that question, then listen, I won't release that information to the public. So basically, it's not going to hurt you, but it can only help you, which I mean, any intelligent person knows that's not true. Right. And I always like I really do appreciate law enforcement and what they do in certain in certain cases. But I always tell people never take a polygraph test, never take a polygraph exam. Um, I just don't find them to be super accurate. I think that they're usually just interrogation tools. I've seen them used as interrogation. We saw that with Chris Watts, right? We, we kind of did see that with Chris Watts and, and the detective who was talking to him from the FBI where, you know, they were like, oh, it shows you lied. You know, who knows if it did or not? But always just talk to a lawyer before you even talk to the police to begin with. But we know that if Wayne had taken that polygraph and if they had asked him, did you kill your wife? And he said no. And it showed deception. That's still going to make him look bad. And that's going to add to the case of the state's attorney as well as law enforcement. So Wayne agreed to do this. He even showed up that day. They said he was like waiting in the lobby. And then at the last minute, he sort of changed his mind and he left. And Lance Richardson said, you know, that invitation is still open. But Lance also did say in Breaking Homicide, he hasn't spoken to Wayne Pope since that day. So I don't think that Wayne Pope's ever going to take him up on that on that invitation. No, and maybe for the reason you're saying. I remember Lance and I talking. I don't know if it made the episode. I don't know what part did, but there was something with it where Wayne was sitting there. He had been waiting a little bit. His lawyer couldn't make it that day. Something happened with his lawyer. It just like things didn't play out the way Wayne wanted them to. And he decided last minute, I'm not taking it. And he just left. But yeah, you're, you're hundred percent right. Lance definitely wanted it. And he said it in the episode. I know this part made it where he was like, I just wanted affirmation that I had my guy. I didn't need to release it to the public, but I just wanted a little bit more combined with what we already had that he failed this polygraph. And as far as your, you said this to me, you said it many times, your perception of a polygraph, you know, I definitely think it's got its flaws because it's not 100% accurate. There, that's proven. That's not even up for debate. And it's not even admissible in, in many states. So um, it is a tool. So from the law enforcement side, when I throw that hat on, we're not banking our whole case on it, whether you fail it or pass it. You know, We're not going to probably get a conviction based on a failed polygraph. But you're right. It is a tool that we use to let us know possibly if we're heading in the right direction. 
So if Wayne failed, it's just one more piece of information we have now to say, this is our guy. This is our guy. So um, it's an interesting thing that it happened. I found I found it interest, interesting that Wayne even agreed and showed up in the first place. But, you know, that could have been just maybe Wayne was pulling their punk card. And then when he realized they were actually going to hook him up, he's like, no, I'm out of here. I'm gone. No, I mean, I, I, I thought I thought you were kind of on the right track as far as like my opinion of it, which I think he was like, yeah, I'm going to like be cooperative. But as a citizen of the United States, I know that I have the right to pull out at any time. So I'm going to go there as if I have this good intention, as if I, you know, like an like an AK innocent person would, you know, I'm using air quotes because I have said time and time again, I don't believe it makes you look guilty if you don't want to take a polygraph test and you shouldn't make anybody or allow anybody to make you feel that you're guilty because you don't want to take one. But I think he was like, let me show them I'm cooperative. And then at the last minute, he was like, oh, no, I've changed my mind. I'm nervous about this. I'm anxious about it. And he has the right to do that. So it, it, can't, it can't really hurt him if he if he does this. It looked like he was going to do it. And then all of a sudden he pulled out at the last minute. So it doesn't make him any more guilty or look any more guilty than he looked before, essentially. I, I would I would argue the one thing is I agree with everything you said, but I bet you there are people I'll even say it, myself included that are like, yeah, he didn't want to take the polygraph because he knew he was going to fail it. And so therefore he looks even more guilty to me. Like you refusing to take it. I'm just talking for myself, no, not for I Stephanie. Yeah. You you choosing, because I've had many people where I'm like, oh, I'm going to hook you up to a polygraph. And they're like, absolutely. Where's the machine? I'm ready right now. Let's do it. And I'm like, nah, I don't want to give it to you now. You were too willing to take it. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm like, yeah, I'll pass. But so for me, him not taking Yo, that's it. that's sneaky, man. It's true. It's true. <laughs> true. Because listen, we didn't have a polygrapher on our, our staff. We we're a smaller department. In, right? Oh, yeah. Money. Yeah. So I would be like, hey, listen, man, we got a polygraph examiner in the next room. Some machine's ready to go. Um, Would you be willing to take the test? And they're like, yeah, absolutely. Let's go do it right now. I'm like, all right, let me see if he's out. And then I come back. Oh, now he's out to lunch. And you know what? I believe you. you're all set. You can get out of here. So, um, you know, I, I I do think it does show a little bit of, and this is not just for Wayne, this is for anyone. When someone's completely against taking it, it does make me wonder, like, why are you so nervous? Is it because you've done your research like a Stephanie Harlow, or you just know, hey, if I lied, this machine's going to be able to tell them, so I'm not going to take it. <laughs> you know, it's it's all subjective. It's opinion. It's a completely opinionated thing, but we both agree that you failing a polygraph to te test, not only for, on a personal level, but even in the eyes of the law doesn't hold a ton of weight anymore. I've, I've always wanted to get hooked up to a polygraph like machine, not not in an actual investigation. I, please. I do it. I did it. I did because it. Was, I would it was say no. -wracking. If the cop was like, you want to take a polygraph? I'd say absolutely not. And then if it's Derek, he's going to be like, this girl's guilty, man, because I would say absolutely not. I'm way too paranoid, but I want to take it just to see if I can like lie Deceive and it. get away with it. Right. And there, and there are there are there are tactics that you can use. Mm -hmm. You can take medication. Some people in the past for FBI exams, like when they're applying for the FBI, would put a thumbtack in their shoe. And what you would do is when you were answering even honest questions, you'd step on the thumbtack, which to increase your off, baseline, right? Yep. Yes. Yep. To increase your baseline. So there are <laughs> things around it, but they ask you questions like, have you done anything to alter the test today? But I did take a polygraph test for multiple things, um, for some federal jobs and also for ID con a few years ago where they had a polygraph examiner there. It was more for fun. But I was genuinely nervous because he was asking me questions that I wasn't prepared for. And he was asking me things like, do you like your wife's cooking and stuff? And I was like, yikes. And the thing's spiking like yikes. crazy. <laughs> so, you know, like I got to the point where I remember one question he asked me was, have you ever worn makeup? And the answer is I definitely have not only on the show, but also like when I was a kid with my sisters and mm -hmm. stuff. So I'm like, so I'm like, yeah, of course I have 400 people laughing at me now because <laughs> obviously the, the needle didn't move. So that was my experience in the public with it. But regardless of whether my, the point is, I'm trying to support what you're saying as far as I had nothing to hide and I was still anxious and nervous, which could have caused me to look like I was deceiving the po right. the, the examiner. Right. So I agree with you that there's so many outside elements that could cause something in that machine to suggest you're lying when really you're just nervous. Nervous. So so I, I agree with you. I don't disagree at all. Yeah, I still want to take one so bad. I'm sure we can make that happen at one of these events. CrimeCon had a, a polygraph examiner there. She was downstairs. Her father does it. He's actually the one that gave me the exam. So I'm sure we can set that up for a future episode where we put Stephanie Harlow on a polygraph exam and I get to ask the questions. Oh, please. I will, I will <laughs> beat it. Like. <laughs> Oh, I'll put money on that because one. Because I remember Whoop. we were talking to to Sexton too, and he was like, "Oh, you know, when I was interrogating Wayne, I, you know, he seemed genuinely and sincerely to just not have any idea what I was talking about. Like, I've 
interviewed people. Some of them, it's clear when they're lying. You know, he seemed to genuinely believe it when he said, no, I had nothing to do with this. And I said, well, some people are just good liars. You know, some people are just really good at lying. And he said, absolutely. Yeah, we we got the opportunity to watch the interrogation footage. We didn't include the interrogation footage uh, in its entirety for copyright reasons in the episode, but you you got a screenshot of it and you can hear it. He he's he's not bad. He's pretty he's pretty cool, calm and collected for sure. And and Body Sexton language pushed was him. open. I felt like yep. you know he was yep. kind of just like like very. But you know some people are just super good liars. Like they are so used to it. It comes so naturally to them. It comes natural second to breathing. And then I'm sure we all know at least one person like that, that they've lied to our faces. And we've been like, whoa, like usually I have a really good hold on when someone's being dishonest with me. And I never, I never knew. Mm -hmm. So it's just uh, all sorts. We want to hear, we talked about that a little bit. We want to hear what you think. Comment down below whether you would take a polygraph test or not. If you were innocent, if you got brought in for questioning, you know, you're innocent. Would you take the polygraph exam and tell us why or why not? as far as if you would take it. And, I think and that's this interesting is a murder, see. okay? So if someone oh, yeah. thinks you've murdered someone, that, you know you're innocent. Would you take yeah, a polygraph? Would, would, you, would you take it? And whether you would or not, tell us why. Yeah. I think the comments are going to blow up on that one. Yeah. And I think they're going to be on your side for sure. I think so. Oh, 100%. You might actually win one this week. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I usually win. Oh, God. They just don't want to hurt your feelings. They know you're more sensitive than I am. I am. I am very sensitive. Well, I want to talk about the oceanographer because you had interviewed her on Breaking Homicide for this case. You guys actually like went out in the boat. Looks super cool. Mm -hmm. I love going on boats. But um, I forget her name. Refresh my memory. Doctor. I believe it's Cecily. Dr. Cecily Stepp. Her Step, last yeah. name is definitely Stepp. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So she said that that night that Robin's believed to have gone in the water. The tide was very strong. And it mm -hmm. was pushing down the bay. But she also said that Robin's body should have reached its final destination within just a few hours. Yet she was not found until 23 days later. Now, there's a few reasons this might happen. A very few reasons why this might happen. None of them look good for Robin. Can you talk about no. that a little bit more? Yeah. So she really, this wasn't just for TV purposes. This woman is brilliant. She teaches or she's a professor at a local, um, I want to say like there in Annapolis, there's like a military base there, like a Naval Academy. She's like teaches there. She's like, she's one of the best of the best. Nobody knows that water better than her. She looked up the date and time for the currents for that area, the temperatures. She really was like, if I'm going to do this, um, I want to know everything about it. Cause that's my reputation. So we, we loved her and you know, the, the going out on the boat was, you know, it really didn't do anything for her that day because she was looking at past data, but it was more for TV and it was a cool, it was more, it was a cool shot. And it was also a different angle for us to look at the dock, which we did want. Um, and yeah, as you said, there were a few things. First, the obvious thing, if you go into the water, regardless of how buoyant you may be, if you're conscious, you're going to float to some degree. Um, however, if you're unconscious or already dead, you'll more than likely sink. Um, cause you're not, you know, taking in oxygen. And so she believed based on the current, as you just said, she, if she was awake and coherent, she most likely would have floated right to the destination where she was eventually found like a Bella who died of hypothermia. Um, but because, and this is in, uh, Dr. Stepp's opinion, she believes she went in the water. And at that point she was either unconscious, severely injured or already dead. And that would, that would explain why she not only went in the water, sunk immediately to the bottom and then she got caught on something at the bottom because although it's you know the water there are things that get thrown in afterwards there's rocks there's trees there's all these different things that she can get caught on so in her opinion what happened was she immediately sunk to the bottom got stuck on something the gases filled up in her body as decomposition started to take place eventually causing her to come off the object she was stuck on bringing her back to the surface and then having her go down the, the water th 23 days later in, direct, in whatever direction the current was going on that particular day. So I just want to clarify some things because I, I remember this is very similar to uh, the, the Lacey Peterson situation. Um, what happened, especially here, because it's March. So it's the beginning of March. She goes missing. And she doesn't and Robin doesn't resurface till towards the end of March. So it's cold. You know, it's Maryland. It's it's very cold in March. It was very cold that night. And that has a lot to do with why the body wouldn't resurface as well. 
So you said if she went into the the water and she sinks immediately, which is what the ocean the, the oceanographer believes happened, because it took so long for Robin to resurface. And if she had gone in the water when she was alive, she would have been pushed by the current out. And she would have come up a lot sooner, just like Bella did. So she goes in the water. She's either dead when she goes in the water or she's unconscious to the point where she's not going to be taking in a lot of oxygen. So her body's Mm -hmm. not going to be buoyant and it won't float. She's going to sink right away. So even if she went in after a blow to the head or something that made her unconscious within a very short time, she will be dead because she's not conscious enough to swim and keep herself afloat, right? That's kind of what you that's kind of what we were what we were going over. That's the what we believe happened. That's the reason. Yeah. Think about it this way, guys. You go into the water. You're at the beach or whatever. What are you doing? You're swimming around. You're playing, but you're breathing. So there's air in your lungs. So even when you're, someone's drowning, there's usually air in their lungs while they're in the water. If you're unconscious five, 10 minutes or dead five or 10 minutes before you're put in the water, you've exhausted all that air out of your lungs. So therefore, you're just no pun intended, but you're dead weight. Right. You're, you're just you're just you're just a body at that point. There's not much to keep you buoyant, to keep you on the surface. And just like a lot of things that you would think if she went in the water and she was alive and she was swimming and trying to get back to shore, she probably would have floated down to where she was eventually found. Because even when she was found, if you remember from the first part of this, she was found on the surface. It wasn't like there was a, re, you know, a, a crew out there, a rescue crew that was looking for her or a diver that found her on the bottom. Her body floated back up to the surface and she was found under a rock, a rock that was shaped like an arrowhead at the surface. The fisherman was just literally with his daughter. He looked down, the body was right there out of nowhere. There was even some people who believed that maybe her body was put in the water afterwards, maybe only a few days prior to her being found. And that was not only discredited by Dr. S- uh, Sergeant Sexton, but even when I asked Dr. Step about it, her body and the level of decomposition based on how cold the water was, was completely consistent with her being in the water for that duration, that 23 dur- day duration. Yeah. And I think that's important because I truly believe, and we're going to go over theories, what we think might have happened at the end of of this episode. But I truly believe if she'd gone in there alive, being a strong swimmer, She lived on the water. She was very, very physically fit, strong. I think that she would have been able to swim, right? And she would have been able to swim down, let the current push her, find a place she could grab onto, she could pull herself up. That's not what happened. So I 1 million percent believe when she went in that water, she was either dead or unconscious. And you also have to think, if she's unconscious when she goes in the water, what is she not going to be doing? Holding her breath to prevent water from going into her lungs. So like I said, within a couple minutes, even if she's not dead when she goes in, if she's unconscious, she'll be dead very soon because she's not conscious. She's not awake to know that she needs to be holding her breath and not letting water just go into her mouth and her nose. Absolutely. One thing here and there you think, oh, maybe she could have jumped in, but we talked about it last episode, the heels, the blouse, the fact that it appears based on science that she sunk immediately. All these little things in totality paint a pretty good picture, which is when she entered the water, She was either severely injured, unconscious, or already dead. Nothing that we found, and we're looking for outliers, nothing that we have found to this point suggests in any way, shape, or form that whether, you know, that Robin Pope went into the water under her own will. Nothing, which is what we're going off of. So if she didn't, if she didn't jump in the water, someone placed her there. And the list of people who could have done that is very short at this point. Yeah, and we even disagreed a little bit last episode because you were like, I don't think I would jump into the water with high heels on. And I was like, well, I mean, as a woman and as a dog owner who who feels like her dogs are children, I probably would. However, once I'm in that water, if I realize now I have to swim myself to safety, those, those shoes are coming right off. I'm going to reach down while I'm in the water. I'm going to unfasten them, do whatever it takes, get them off so that I can swim better. She did not attempt to do that. No. So I'll even give you this. I'll even give you this. Let's say to your point, she kept her heels on, realizes very quickly she's not going to be able to get Bella or whatever it is. I still think based on how fit she was and how everyone, her daughters, her friends, they all said she was such a great swimmer. Even in heels, she would have at least been able to swim close to the rocks, get up on them and maybe lay there from exhaustion until someone found her. Like there's doesn't appear to be any attempt for her to make her way back to shore. And those things in conjunction with the heels 
are what suggest, you know, she never made any attempt. She went in and wherever she went into the water is where she stayed. She sunk immediately. She probably got caught on something almost right after. I would assume, I have no information to back this up, that she probably floated a little ways down the car, the bay, the bank, because I, I would believe the search effort was incredible. There were family friends, there were divers. I'm assuming they checked the area immediately surrounding her dock. So oh, if she yeah, had they did. Went, yeah. Yeah. So she went down right there, mm -hmm. you know, um, they would have found her. So she probably went out a little ways. And then when she came back up, the current took her back towards the shore. That's, that's my guess. Cause it's a big area of water. This isn't like a lake guys. This is like, yeah. This is a huge area with Chesapeake. Am I saying that Chesapeake Bay? Yeah, Chesapeake Bay. It's ginormous. Huge. <laughs> so it's like this is not a small area of, that they had they had to search. And you also have to consider because, yeah, they, they're going to have divers and stuff, but it's like super dark down there because it's deep, Ew, you yeah. know? And on top of that, they have those boats, police boats with the sonar and stuff on them. But I did a lot of research into this for another case. Like those sonar things, they're so hard to nail down because a body doesn't really look like a body when it's on with the bottom of a body of water. You know, it's not like you would think you're just going to see like an arm and a head. It's like there's just all these shapes down there. And the people who are reading the the sonar, they're the ones that have to determine like, well, what is this shape? Does this shape look like a body or is it just like a bunch of stones? They can't just like look at everything that looks like a body and just go down there. Yeah, there's tires down there. There's a lot of things a that should not stuff. be. Yeah. And then you Agreed. also have to consider that whoever's reading the sonar, like if have they had the appropriate training, because I've seen I've seen a couple of cases where the, the people in the boats with the sonar, they went over the body several times. But because the person who was reading it had never been in that position before or didn't have the proper training with that specific equipment, they missed it. So there's a lot of factors here that can really like you think, oh, you got police dogs and you got divers and you got boats with sonar like you should have found you should have found her. There's a lot of factors here that make it very difficult in this body of water. And I did want to talk to you about something because you said there was a massive search. There was the police and her friends and her community. Friends. Everyone oh, yeah. was looking for her. What do, oh, you, yeah. what do you think it says that Wayne Pope never was? That's a great question. And, you know, I remember us talking about this when we were out there filming the episode. And I try to I try to stay impartial because that's the only way to be objective in your case. So I, I always try to look at both sides to it. And this is what I'll say. Super weird. If it was my wife and I had nothing to do with it, I would be searching for her. However, again, what's the, what's, what do you always say? Don't come for me. Yeah. Don't come for me here. But mm -hmm. let me just be devil's advocate here. This is a woman. If I did, this is if Wayne Pope had nothing to do with it. This is operate under in that, that slim you know, chance that he had nothing to do with it. In that slim chance that he had nothing to do with it. This is a woman that cheated on him. This is a woman that he really didn't have much good things to say about at this point. If he really didn't have nothing to do with it, he might think that maybe she just took off with a man. And also take away those uh, factors, even though there was nothing to implicate him directly at that point, it was very well known by friends and family. They all thought he did it. They all, everyone thought he did it. So if I were that guy and I didn't do it, to go out and with this search and rescue team when they're all under the, the assumption that I killed her, um, I, I think it would be very awkward. So I could see the reason why he wouldn't, but my mindset, if I didn't do it, would be in spite of that to go out there to prove that I really, in spite of what her and I went through, we were together 20 years. I want to be out there and I want to find her, maybe not for me, but for my daughters. Right. And then, I mean, not only that, but he he did say that they were going to like go to counseling and therapy. So apparently, yep. like you love this woman enough to overlook the fact that she betrayed you, that she broke your heart. You're you're willing to go to therapy and work it out, but you're not willing to go out there and look for her or even call her friends to see how the search is going or if there's any like updates or to just let them know like, hey, you know, I personally feel awkward about being out there because I know you guys all think I'm guilty. But I want right. you to know that if you need anything, I'm here. Please call me. Like, I'm just not trying to, like, get in your way. And I don't want to make it awkward for you guys. But if you want me to help, I'm here. I would like to be there. I just want to respect you. Agreed. 100% agree. I think I think ethically, whether he did it or not, it's a bad look. And he should have been out there for for his family. And, and again, offered his services, offered his, you know, to volunteer. But I could see, like you said, if he didn't think he, you know, was a good thing. Hey, listen. I want this to be productive. I don't need people out there yelling at me saying I'm a murderer. It's going to take away from the the task at hand. Um, and maybe we, you know, we should have asked Sexton this. We didn't. 
I don't, and I don't think they did, but maybe they said, Hey, maybe you should stay away. But I don't think they did that because Sexton has said in the past, you know, there was a whole search team for her for multiple days and Wayne never came out. So why would he say that if they recommended he, Dave's the type of dude that would have said, no, I told him not to go. And he, he hasn't. Yeah. So that, that was very odd to me, but let's mm-hmm. dive into the interview with Sexton and then yes. come back and go over our final thoughts. Absolutely. This is a good one, guys. Make sure you watch the whole thing. It's really, really enlightening. Dave Sexton, um, you guys heard me talk about him last week. We talk about law enforcement. We know um, the system is not perfect by any means, but it's always nice when you have someone who checks their ego at the door and ultimately wants what everybody else wants, which is to solve this case. And, and he has said to me since day one, Listen, I, you know, I got to stay within the parameters of my responsibilities as an investigator, but if someone out there has information that can assist him in solving this case, he's all for it. And that still applies today. The case is still open. So as we sit here and we talk to him, he's going to tell us what he can, even though it's an open investigation. And if anybody out there uh, hears anything or sees something that you think is helpful, um, Sarge, they can reach out to the Maryland State Police, I'm assuming. There's a there's a line they can reach out to. Um, they can reach out to I can give my my work email if they want uh to email me. So it's david.sexton at Maryland spelled out dot gov. And guys, don't abuse that. If if don't just email him to tell him he's a he's yeah, a I'll handsome tra- looking fella. I'll track you down. Yeah, <laughs> he can. It. He can track you down. So again, don't inundate him. Don't tell him yeah. how gorgeous he is just you know the only oh, use it for for obviously legitimate reasons so right. without further ado we're going to dive into it we have some questions from last week's episode that we said we were going to talk to david about and obviously stephanie's stephanie was literally yelling at me before i hit record because she started getting into questions and she was like let's let's go derek let's get it going so <laughs> stephanie the floor is yours Okay, so I have I have a couple questions. I wanted to talk. I wanted to start with the timeline because I think that's where we um, kind of struggled the most last night when we recorded the first episode, and that was because Derek did it wrong. He did the math wrong, so you know, eventually we had to figure it out. It put us forty five minutes Happens behind. All the time. Mm-hmm. But GMT what, man, <laughs> GMT. Yeah. What that's what we, the phone. That's what the phone companies use, and it's just mm-hmm. you would you wish you would just do it. As far as, you know, Eastern Standard Time or, you know, West Coast Whatever time, time or, zone. Whatever time right. zone, but yeah. it, they don't. Be too easy. Too logical. Be too easy. Yeah. <laughs> so from what we understand of the timeline, you believe that Robin left the restaurant and left Annapolis around 930, correct? That's correct. That would put her going over the Bay Bridge, heading back towards Wayne's house at yes. around 1005, right? Correct. She talks to him on the phone. What was it about ten twelve? She's she's actually coming across the Bay Bridge about that time just to say, "Hey, look, I am on my way over." This is where we're speculating um, because that's what Wayne says. But I'm on my way over to pick up my mail. Um, she needed to pick up a post hole digger because the next morning she was going to um, work on a fencing project kind of like a side hustle type thing uh for her and um and you know basically that's what he was you know she was telling him f- through his words not for through hers but we don't have anything recorded or anything like that and then we have text messages back and forth between her and him you know hey I'm coming over can I come over and, and pick up the postal digger can I come over and get my mail and see Bella the dog what was she doing in Annapolis? Because she had texted him earlier and said she was at an, a job interview. She was uh, meeting up with a general manager of uh, GNC over in Annapolis because she wanted it. She was looking for another, you know, just another job, an extra, some extra cash. And uh, she was meeting with him, I guess, for drinks or something just to go over, you know, kind of like a, a little interview, I guess. Um, they met uh, and then she came back. After they met, I don't know how long they they were uh, off memory. I I don't remember, but it was it was probably at least an hour over there um, in a, in Annapolis at a restaurant in Annapolis. And you believe that while she was in Annapolis, Wayne also was in Annapolis. Wayne actually told us that he was he had gone to Annapolis to meet with friends. I think he said between five and five thirty, he met with some friends um, for for dinner. And then at some point he was going to go see his daughter, uh, Rachel, 
who was supposedly working over there. But I think, and, and correct, I, I may be wrong, but I don't think she was working that night. But basically, she told he told us that he was going to go drop off some food for her. And Rachel, when we talked to Rachel, says, well, my dad really never, really never drops food off to me. Um, but then we found out pretty much, we were pretty sure that he was, he wanted to find out where Robin was because he knew that she was, could be out with another man. Um, because of their their problems in the past, so they were separated, of course, because of 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 their the marital problems. Um, she wasn't living at home, and I think he was acting like the jealous husband, uh, the estranged husband, and he was he wanted to know where she was. And did you verify that he had dinner with friends in Annapolis that night? Those friends, yeah, we talked to the friends in Annapolis. He did have dinner, uh, and I can't remember the time. Uh, Exactly, but it was probably I I, I want to say five or five thirty. They were, but according, but based on what I remember, our conversation mm-hmm. that was verified. But without getting into too many specifics, you were able to pretty much confirm that even after that dinner, he stuck around Annapolis for a while. A lo- after that dinner, right? And so, and and that correlated with the time. Just so happens to correlate with the time that that's when Robin was there as well. Correct. So the question becomes what, you know, what were you doing there? If you weren't seeing Rachel and the dinner was already over, which you were able to talk to those individuals Mm -hmm. is I'm assuming you had coordinates that were in in line with where Robin was. I think it's reasonable for anybody, not just a detective like yourself to assume there's something there. There's something there. The funny part about it is that, you know, basically Rachel was working at the mall over there or somewhere near the mall and this restaurant happened to be in the mall. So. He uh, tells us he was going to see Rachel, and I can't remember the name of the restaurant. Interesting, me, but um, or or, the, or the, the area of the mall, but um, you know, basically that was his, I guess, alibi, alibi for being yep. over there to see Rachel. But I don't think I think we came to the conclusion that Rachel wasn't even working that night. She was actually with friends somewhere. Uh, I want to say it in College Park. So so wait. Robin was having dinner or drinks at a restaurant in the mall. And around Wayne was mall. in around yeah. the mall. Wayne was in that general area. He was in that general area, yeah. And he's he even he even tells us that he was in that general area. Okay. Looking, you know, g- going to see Rachel. Um he doesn't say that he went to see Robin or he was stalking Robin or anything like that. Um but we were, and I can't really talk talk about it, but we do know that he he was pretty much there to find out where she was. I don't think he found her. He probably found her car, but I don't think he knew exactly where she was. Yeah, he so. wasn't watching her, but the, he had an inclination she was there, which mm-hmm. is why he stuck around. Right. So, Dave, uh, uh, Dave, uh, real quick, Stephanie, before you go into that, Dave, just to give everyone a perspective here, because Stephanie's been researching these cases for a long time. But there's a lot of new people who don't really know how the mind of, you know, I'm a former detective, but I'm not in it anymore. You're in it. You're in the field right now. You're a sergeant. You're handling your Maryland State Police, not a small Mm -hmm. department. Let people have a little bit of an insight as to why this is important, not just for this case, but in general. Why is it so important to establish going into as far as, hey, listen, you, you know, motives, things like that. Why is this important to an investigator where this isn't the actual crime scene, but it's just as important? Because you're trying to establish right. a motive for it, right? Exactly. So um, how does that work for you? You know, how does I, that go into these cases? I think with this case, I mean, you, we pretty much try to lock people into a story. And then once that we lock them into a story, then we have to go out and do more investigation as far as, okay, did he go to dinner with um, the, these friends? Yes, he did. Okay, did he meet Rachel? No, he didn't. Um you know, once they, once we lock them into a story, then there, you know, of course we have to check off the, there's a red flag. Here's a red flag. Um, you know, so credibility, that, that kind of thing. When we, when you lock somebody into a story right away, um, and they're scrambling to figure out what they should say, uh, most times they will, will say something and it'll, you know, he'll, I guess maybe he thought Rachel would say, yeah, he, he, I was working or maybe he thought she was working and, she would say to us, yeah, I was working that night, but you know, that was something that he said that was in error. And, um, we know that he didn't, he didn't even, she didn't see him that night. 
And if you yeah. if your daughter's working in the mall and you're at the mall to go see her, even if you don't bring her any food or anything, why didn't you go into the the shop where she was working and say, "Hey, I'm heading back to Annapolis or to uh, to Stevensville, um, but I just want to say hi to you." No, that kind yeah. Of so it's so it's a so it's checking out possible motives and also right. gauging the credibility of someone that you're dealing with because at this point he's a person of interest. You know, he's just someone that you're talking to, obviously. But just like in any case, guys, what what he's saying here is, you know, initially we take it, an initial statement from these people. We want to see what their initial reaction is, because a lot of times if they're telling the truth, it'll just come from the, you know, from the brain to the mouth. Mm -hmm. And then it allows them to have some data to go back and cross reference to kind of gauge right. whether it's a witness or a person of interest, how much they can be trusted. And like he just said, in this particular case, they get a story, they lock it in, right? They have it on paper. And then they can go back and do what they do, which is to confirm or discredit what they're saying. It's, right. it's interesting stuff. And it's something that that's, this is how a case starts guys from the start. They're not going into it with any, uh, bias. They're just looking at it objectively. Hey, Wayne, you tell us what happened. We don't know what's the situation. Right. And then all you do is go back and confirm whether he's telling the mm -hmm. truth or not. It's not that difficult. And you know, he, he didn't deny that she was at the, that she came to the house. Uh, you know, her car was still there, of course, when, when he called police or he called 911, the car and her purse and everything was still there. So it wasn't like he was denying that she didn't come to the house. So we know that she came to the house and at some point they had this, this whole thing about falling asleep and, uh, you know, waking up and finding her parked outside and her dozed off in the car. That's all a lie. That's a lie. Uh, I 100% believe that's a lie. Um, you know, and, and he says he leaves because he doesn't like being at the house the same time she is because in the past they've had problems. And his attorney says, hey, when Robin comes by the house to see the dog or whatever to pick up things, you leave and let her do what she does. So you guys don't have any any problems. There's no allegations. Um, we always, we were whenever we were investigating this case initially, I was very surprised that she came over in the evening because that place is very dark. It was very cold. It was, uh, you know, almost March 1st. Um, the wind had been blowing like probably 25 miles an hour there. It's right on the bay. It's right on the bay, the house. Oh yeah. You so, took me there. Yeah. You know, you, you know how, yeah. how cold it it's is. It's cold. It's cold, man. Um, so we were very surprised that, she came to the house by herself. Um, I don't know if he said something to her on the phone that made her come, but I mean, she's texting him back and forth saying, Hey, I'm going to come over and get the mail. So, um, you know, maybe she, we do know that she'd been drinking a little bit, but you know, uh, I don't think, think enough to, to cloud, you know, cloud her, her, uh, you know, cloud her memory or cloud her, um, her, judgment exactly just for the purposes of kind of making it more organized for the listener i'm going to go kind of back to the timeline and then as we go upon these areas then i want to really pick your brain about what exactly was happening at that point so i'm going to go back i'm going to go back to 545 she texts him robin texts wayne and says on a job interview what's up we think at this point wayne is in annapolis and robin's in annapolis yes is there any time where he texts her and he lets her know he's in Annapolis or is he making that kind of a secret? No, because, he, no. he never, he never, uh, allow Now I, I may be wrong. I don't have the case. Like I said, I don't have the case file in front of me. Um, but I don't recall him ever texting her saying, Hey, I'm in Annapolis too. You know, we should meet up or whatever. You know, um, I don't think that ever, the only thing he did was he was in Annapolis with friends to, to eat dinner. And then at some point he was, he was, driving around, maybe even walking around looking for a car or something just to find out where she was. And at 9.03 p.m., Wayne calls Rachel. Is he in Annapolis at that point? I don't recall. I think he was in Annapolis. I'm not, I, I don't recall that at all. Do I'd you know what he talked the, to her about? No. Not off the top of your head? Okay. Not off the top of my head, no. Nothing that gave us any kind of red flag as far as conversation. Okay, so when she's driving, she gets there all those texts come through at 1059. Can I get my mail? Can I get my mail? Can I get my mail? Derek and I were thinking this has to be some sort of glitch. She couldn't have texted them all 
like that and sent them so quickly? Was it a service glitch where because it's so isolated, the the phone dropped service and it didn't send the texts until the service kicked back in? Or was Wayne's phone off? So the cell phone records aren't going to show that those texts came in until 1059 because then the longer text comes in right after that as well. Um, I, I think that it was a service glitch because that area, the cell service is terrible right on that peninsula. Um, and, you know, her cell, even if his cell phone was off, her cell is still sending the text messages. So I think it was, I think it had to do with, serv- with the cell service itself. And if it was, I know with the kind of a storm go- coming through and the wind and everything, I th- that that definitely has um, more problems. My dog decided to come. <laughs> um, canine sad. Canine. He's hearing. Yeah. He's hearing about the story. It's okay. um, so, uh, <laughs> as far as uh, the text messages, the times, I think that was that was definitely service oriented. Cell tower. You know what's interesting, Dave. It be, and, I, and it was something that <clears throat> Stephanie brought up when we recorded part one, and it's a really fascinating theory, and I think it has some credence to it because I think a lot of people, including myself, you know, the assumption is that it was a service thing where she didn't have service, and then or he didn't have service, and then all of a sudden there's this blast of these four texts that were probably sent further apart, but they all went through at the same time. Right. But just to just to entertain the idea for a second, because again, you got to think of everything and explore all possibilities. You know, what if, what if he had shut his phone off for a short period of time so she couldn't call him? And then, you know, according to Wayne, he falls asleep and he doesn't wake up till 1130. So technically at 1059, he's, he's sleeping. It's interesting. I got that in air quotes for the audio people, by the way, he's sleeping. However, if Stephanie's theory that that actually represents the time where the phone was turned on, if there were a way to prove that. It would completely contradict the idea or his his alibi that he was sleeping. I don't think you can, but do you know well, of any? He has. We only had Wayne's cell phone records. That was the issue. Correct. We don't have Robin's, so we could be able to right. tell from Robin's if she had sent them at different at those times. times. We have. Yeah. We have Robin's also, so um, I, I couldn't really tell you what you know. I I, I can surmise that as far as Wayne's phone. He could have turned his phone off. He could have acted like he was asleep because he's done it before where she has come over to the house to pick up mail and, and said, hey, I'm coming over. This is in the daytime. And then Wayne says, yeah, okay, sure. And then doesn't you know, open the door for her. Just to and give her a hard yeah, time. And give, just to give her a hard time. Because he's so a he's control done freak. That. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so, so he can do that. So he's done that in the past. I and win, I have no doubt that he did it this time. And maybe it was done for more sinister uh, actions than just messing with her. Yeah. It's interesting to think though, right? I mean, it's again, not something you can prove, but imagine if you could, if you could, if there was a technology or a way to determine through the carrier that, Hey, listen, there was service in that area at that time. And you know, there was no outage or something and we can tell, and I don't think you can, but you can tell when someone electronically activates or deactivates a phone, whether it's airplane mode or completely physically turning the phone off. Like, Hey, the phone itself was not receiving a signal from 1045 to 1059. Again, I don't think it's possible, but when she brought it up last night, I said, ooh, you know what you're saying there, right, Stephanie? You're saying that if you're right, that shows right there, even though he's trying to play the whole I was asleep, I didn't get it. Those text messages coming in succinctly like that could represent a time where he was active on his phone. You know, you know, you just it's mm-hmm. an interesting question to pose. Unfortunately, we may not have the answer, but again, and it's, I'm glad you brought it up. We don't have Robin's call logs and, and, and for good reason you have them, but, um, I'm sure people are going to ask us like, oh, you know, did they cross reference Robin's text messages and phone calls with this? And I'm assuming your answer would be, oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you, yeah you, guys, mean, we, you guys looked into that. Yeah, we do. We, ha- we looked extensively into those, um, those, uh, cell records, um, just because we we couldn't interview Robin, of course. So basically, our interview f- for Robin was her text messages. We know we knew that she was out with you know a job interview. You, we knew she was. She asked Wayne if she could come. If she could come over. Um, I wasn't real concerned with the uh, service issues um, 
whether he had his phone on or not, because I had Robin's phone. We, we knew that she was coming over there at a certain time, but we also know that this whole thing about, oh, I fell asleep uh, before she got here, and then an hour later I woke up, that is all total BS and a lie. You um, called them out on that in the interrogation. You oh, said, yeah. mm -hmm. you said, what you said, what you said exactly, they were on the call, call for 13 minutes. She was only about, what, 15 she minutes was, away at that if, point? If that, you, and I said, you knew she was coming over. Uh, and then you laid down on the couch and fell asleep and woke up in an hour when you know that your wife, your estranged wife that you're having problems with is coming over to pick up mail and see the dog and pick up this post, postal digger. Um, didn't make sense at all. Now, I can understand if she was an hour away and you fall asleep, but he was on the phone with her back and forth texting, and he knew she was coming over. So, um, you know, I, I wasn't real concerned about the, the timeline with the service glitches because being over you, you there. You already came to the conclusion oh, yeah, he wasn't we, sleeping. We, had, we were having problems with service over there when we were over there doing search warrants and things like that. So. We know that there's there was a delay, um, but I had problems with his his story, um, especially that aspect of the story, the the hour long. You know, I I fell asleep at ten thirty and woke up at took a nap thirty, because Robin Robin would not have parked the car, and just waited for him to come out to tell her, hey, you can go in. She would have probably gone up and sit and knocked on the door, hey, where's my mail? And then of course he did the. The same thing that he's done in in the in past history. We we checked with the sheriff's the local sheriff's office there and state police, and they've had to go out a couple times for that reason where she was coming to pick up something, and uh, kind of like a domestic um, uh, related thing where you know she needs somebody to needs a police officer to be there so that you know nothing Keep happens. Keep the peace. Yeah. Um. So we know that he's done it in the past and. Yeah, you know, this night I don't think was any different. Let me ask you a question. She got there at ten thirty. He says he didn't wake up till eleven thirty. That's when he sees her in his car, in her mm. car. He said he was sleeping on the couch. You're familiar with the layout of the house. Where's the couch? Is you know when you're looking at the front door, where would the couch or the living room be? So I think the the couch was uh, kind of backed up to a window that that faces out the back toward the bay, mm -hmm. um, if memory serves me correct, and. The house is up a little higher than where the driveway is, so he may have seen headlights. Um, well, what I'm thinking he is he would like, have, he would have seen or heard Robin knocking on the door. She would have knocked on the door, and Bella's inside. The dog's gonna bark. I have dogs. Every time somebody right. walks up to the house, they go crazy barking. Mm -hmm. So we're to believe he's asleep on the couch, and she's obviously gonna knock on the door. She's not gonna sit in her car and wait for right. him, like you said. Bella's gonna start going crazy and barking, and he's not going to wake up. So. I mean, off the record, if you want, but is it your belief that in that hour period between 1030 and 1130, if Wayne was the person who killed her, is that when it happened? I, I, I totally believe that between 1030 and 1130, that that is when, so, that is when something happened to Robin, um, whether it was, and I know we've talked to about it uh, before, Derek, as far as whether it was a terrible accident or whether she, he got into a fight with her on the, you know, got her to the, the pier and pushed her in or maybe knocked her over, maybe knocked her out and threw her in. Um, but, you know, there's so many theories right now that we have. I mean, I've, I've got a couple theories and I, I know I've talked to Derek about it. Um, I think he used the dog to get her to that area, to that point, because he's done things in the past with the dog throwing the dog in a pool. Yeah, and this we covered dog, it in episode one. It's a, it's telling, a huge, telling Robin that he right. put, it, put the dog down. Put the dog down, Stuff exactly. Like that, yeah. And that mm -hmm. was corroborated by a cable guy who was at her house when this happened. So it wasn't like mm -hmm. something that one of her friends you know, made up a story or something. It, this, was, this was corroborated by a cable guy that had no uh, you know, uh, association with her at all, except for putting in a cable. Yeah, no skin in the game. What, did, what about keys? Stephanie and I hit on that a little bit. You know, they were together for almost 20 years. She was living there with him before this whole incident went down. Were you able to establish whether or not she still had keys to the house or whether he switched? I'm assuming he might have switched the locks. I I believe, and I you know, I can't say, you know, 100%, but I Did, believe he, he changed the locks so that she wouldn't be able to get in. That's why she had to call him all the time yep. 
to make yep. sure that he was there so that he could open the door for her, you know? So. Right. And she left the keys in the car. Whenever she got out, for whatever reason, there was a reason she left the keys behind because they were useless at that yeah, house. She wasn't going to use the keys to, for the house. Yeah. No. Yeah. I want to ask you about Wayne's trip. And there's a, there's a few reasons I want to ask you about it because Derek and I were going over it yesterday. The timeline doesn't really make sense to me. Now, one of uh, Robin's friends, I keep, oh, Debbie, she says Wayne comes to her house around like 1.15 in the morning. Yes. And, and he's asking her, have you seen Robin? Wayne's at the 7-Eleven, two towns over, at 1.07 a.m. It's about an eight-minute drive from where yeah. he was back to Stevensville. So when does he have time from 7-Eleven, between 7-Eleven and Debbie's house, to go home and see that Robin and Bella are gone? And then look for them long enough to realize that he needs to now go wake her friend up in the middle of the night. Um, and like I said, I, I would have to see the, the timelines and all that stuff. but. Um, I know that that 7-Eleven trip was basically like I like Derek and I had talked about before, kind of like, "Hey, look at me! I'm Wayne. I'm coming into yeah. 7-Eleven." <laughs> yeah. um, you know, and yeah, then the other thing, the, where's the time for him to go back to his house? Be like, "Oh, that, Robin and Bella aren't here." The, that 7-Eleven is not that far away uh, from from their house. I know you said two towns over, but it's, eight, it's eight really minutes. not. It's eight it's minutes. It's eight minutes, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so what I'm saying is if he's at Debbie's house at one fifteen and he's at 7-Eleven at one o seven, and it takes eight minutes to drive from the 7-Eleven right. back to his house, when did he check to see that Robin and Bella were missing mm -hmm. and he couldn't find them? I don't have an answer for you. Because I, yeah. I, I don't know what the, you know, I don't, I know as far as the interview goes, his interview states that he went to, you know, and we we always thought it was weird that he would have gone to a friend's house first to go. Yeah, you know, goes goes to a friend's house in the middle of the wife, night when his wife's car is there. She's not going to walk to the friend's house unless she got picked up by her friend at the. Then you at could the, just call the house. And you could <laughs> just call. So why not call nine one one first? Say, look, my wife is here. We're estranged. She came to pick up something. I left because my attorney told me not to be here, and when I came back. You know she's gone. So and she's gone. Why go to Debbie's house? Why go to Seven Eleven? Um, there's so there's he, no time for him right. to have gone home and and saw that that Robin right. and Bella so weren't there. Already, there's no time. So he already knew that she was gone. something. Yeah, she already. Yeah, and that's what we that. were trying to. That's what we were trying to establish yeah. because I did say to give. I'm not trying to give Wayne any out here. Obviously, um, I said in the episode how I feel about it, but. Okay. You know, it's one of those things where even if the timeline is a little off where he didn't go to Debbie's till like 120 or 130, like I, I was yeah. saying to, I was saying to Stephanie, you know, sometimes the times the recollections can be off five or 10, maybe even 20, some people are really off, but to Stephanie's point, even if it is to go home, see that she's not there, look through the house, look at the dock, look, look around, you know, process, yeah. process that, Hey, something's not right here. I need to go talk to someone. It, it's going to take longer than 10 minutes. It's going to be a series of phone calls and text messages to her first. Then once you've tried everything. Which there were not. There was nothing. No. Yeah. There was nothing. So that's what we're getting at here on he top even of call everything her else. Before no. going to Debbie's house. It doesn't make any sense. And then he calls her at what? one thirty or something? one forty, And he says, call he me. One, 128. Call me. call me. Yeah. Why did he do that? As far as you remember from interviewing him. Wouldn't he have looked inside of her car before figuring out she was missing and saw that her cell phone was her in there? So why would he be? The... Why would he be texting her? Yeah, I, I, I don't know why he'd do that. I know maybe at some point, maybe he just thought, hey, maybe I better call her cell phone and make it look like I'm, you know, I well, know where she yeah. is. Now I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. That, I don't know that he saw her cell phone. But you know, well, if, he had, if he had something he... to do with this, if he had something to do with her. Her uh, disappearance, and then you know, I I can't death. really say murder death, because her death. right now her death is still uh, you know undetermined. undetermined because when she was found, there were no blunt, there was no blunt force trauma, there was no you know there was no gunshot. Clear, clear that no up stabbing, for people though. There was nothing. Clear that up for people. It's not that that didn't happen. Her body was so badly decomposed, it was unable to be determined, right? right. That's, that's, right. it's not what guys, what he's saying is, and it does say like, there was no blunt force trauma, no stab wounds, no nothing no like visible. that. It, nothing no visible. No visible doesn't mean it didn't occur. It just means that she was in the water for 23 days and the, the coroner, the, the doctor was unable to determine 
if those injuries existed mm-hmm. because of how badly the body was decomposed. Right. Big difference there. Yeah, there was nothing. There was nothing outwardly observed. Um, now, was she struck on the head and knocked out, and then fell in the in the bay? If it was something minor, then you know, of course, being in the bay for that long, you wouldn't see any kind of bruising or anything on the skin, anything like that. So that's what we're looking at. I mean, that's what we think happened, that she was either struck or pushed in, uh, and she's struggling. It was very cold. The water was very cold. Uh, maybe got disoriented. and Still wearing her high still heels. Still wearing her high heels. So, um, you know, definitely they think that she was alive when she went in, but that's still undetermined because a lot of times right. um, you go in and even if, even if you're, let's say that she was knocked out and breathing shallow, you know, had some shallow breathing or not breathing at all, um, that much time in the bay, you're still going to have a little bit of water inside your lungs. So that's why it's all undetermined. Um, believe me, when... I was elated when we found when we when the body her and her body was found, and then dejected when I went to the autopsy and there was nothing out really there was nothing to show that she had been murdered or that it was a homicide. So that's the whole problem with this case is that you know water man yeah water it's a, it's a bitch mm-hmm. it's a bitch on when it comes to a homicide investigation for sure yeah. And like I said, there are so many red flags with him um, not wanting to take the polygraph and telling us he was going to take the polygraph and his timeline with the set, like you said, with the 7-Eleven and going to his parents' house, nobody seeing him, you know, that all, uh, yeah, that's, that's all those are all red puts- flags and he had motive, he had opportunity. Um, mm-hmm. There were no witnesses at all. Um with the exception of people the next morning with the look, you know, watching what he was doing once her, once the dog was found, I guess, I don't know if you ever touched on the dog, but the dog was yes. found um, the next morning and it was determined by a vet that the dog didn't drown. The dog died of hypothermia. So yep. the dog was able to get to the banks of the bay but because of the riprap, the big rocks and things like that, and because of how old Bella was, she was almost 10. Um, and for a big dog like that, um, that's very old. She, she was yeah. very old. Uh, yeah, Great Dane's life just, expectancy. She probably couldn't even get up. Or maybe she was trying to go back for Robin. We don't know. When he um, found the dog, well, he didn't find the dog. His neighbor did. She said he looked at, at the dog once. He made a comment like, that's not the worst of it. My wife and my dog went missing yesterday. He walked away. Yet later he told you he sustained these injuries on his sides, the bruising and the scratching from trying to get Bella out of the water. But we know from Elaine Jerry, that's not what yeah, happened. Elaine, the, the neighbor said he never once uh, reached down to pick, try to pick the, the dog up. That somebody else did that. He didn't, he didn't do that. So did you ever say to him, Wayne, that was a lie. How did you really get these these injuries? How did you really get these wounds? Because I mean, oh, yeah. we're, I've, I've been keeping track. We're at like four yeah. lies right now, just yeah. straight out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we knew that was a lie. Um, and he, you know, he basically said that's where he, uh, you know, she doesn't, that my neighbor didn't see me. She didn't, she wasn't watching me the entire time. Um, I did, you know, I did try to, to, to go down and, and pick up Bella. And we know that that was a lie. So. So the other speculation is maybe that he he got that injury from being on the edge of the pier, whether he was pushing her in and he fell or trying to keep her from coming back um, because the water was up to, I think it, at the time it was a low tide. So it was only nine feet deep. Nine feet. Yeah. Yep. So um, I don't know how I remember that, but um, must have been, been from breaking homicide because that's what I remember. No. I had to look it up, yeah, so you're better yeah. than me. I we had to look at. I had um, to rewatch the episode too. So uh, maybe fighting with the dog or trying to trying to throw the dog in. You know, he's on his knees. He tries to throw the dog. Throws the dog in. Robin, you know, tries to go after the dog. We don't. We don't know. There's so much speculation. So many theories at that point. 
Um, what we do know is that he was there and he probably had something to do with her, her death. He told, uh, he had mentioned to Debbie, I believe, Robin and I are working things out. We're going to counseling. We're going to therapy. Was there anything in her texts, anything that you heard from her friends or family that suggested Robin had agreed to try to work things out with Wayne or they were attending some sort of therapy or she'd called or had an appointment for some sort of therapy? Anything you came across of that nature? I want to say, and this is, uh, this may be completely off, but I do remember that I think initially they wanted to do some kind of counseling. Wayne didn't want to do it. And then all of a sudden, near the end, before her disappearance, I think um, he was suggesting counseling and she didn't, you know, it was basically, you know, they did not want to, they never did counseling unless they did it in the beginning. But um, uh, I know through talking to friends and I, I, you know, it's been a while since I've, you know, uh, talked about that. But uh, I know that at some point, Wayne did not want to do counseling at all. Um, he was just, he was so incensed by, you know, her inf infidelity that um, uh, he didn't want to do anything. And then maybe later on, they, they tried to work it out. And then, of course, you know, I think anybody that she met, any, any, if she, he found out about her meeting a guy for dinner or anything, that was that just brought all that back. So was she dating somebody at that point? Because I, I'm sure at this point she and Rob were no longer in contact. No, they they were not. Um, he uh, Rob had a fiance, so he basically he was like, and I think Robin thought that Rob was going to stick around, and he and he didn't. Um, once it was all out, uh, you know, of course that's that relationship stopped. As far as uh, anybody knew, uh, I, I don't know of anybody. So do you think that maybe Wayne was upset because he had chased her boyfriend away, maybe thinking that this would cause her to sort of reconcile with him? And then when it didn't, he couldn't even say, well, it's it's not it's no longer because she's with somebody else. It, it truly is now that she just doesn't want to have anything to do with me. Do you think that that could have maybe triggered him a little bit towards the end there? I think the, the whole infidel infidelity was the one that, that was the thing that triggered him um, and him. not. But being you said he wanted to work it. it out at some point that he wanted even after finding that out, he wanted to go to therapy or he was willing to. At yeah, one point, well, but then she no longer was. Yeah, I, I don't think any any therapy would have helped either, no. <laughs> either no. of them. But um, I think he was just more incensed about. You know, and maybe it, that could be, a, you know, I, I don't know what was in his mind as far as his marriage goes, as far as if, you know, he breaks her up, if, if he breaks up the boyfriend relationship and then maybe she'll come back to me type thing. I don't know, maybe, but, um, you know, I, I think the main thing was that it was her infidelity and, you know, um, just from, you know, past history talking to friends about how he treated her during her cancer and, and things like that. Um, he was a, he was definitely a control freak and, um, you know, not real nice to his wife who had breast cancer. So, and that's just from friends. That's, that's not, I never heard anything from Wayne. Right. That's from her, her friend. Getting, getting away from the character of Wayne for a second and really focusing on something tangible, right? Evidence, right? Something that's objective, something that tells a story, whether you want to hear that story or not, to me is, is Robin's blouse. And I thought that was a, you know, there's not a ton of evidence that's been released publicly, but you guys might have more, which is fine. But as far as the blouse, what was your takeaway from the blouse? The fact that it was found perfectly intact. We talked about this. And yet it was completely inside out. And the blouse, correct me if I'm wrong, was found right around the same time that Bella was found. Maybe it was a day later or a day before. So it was I forgot a couple if it was weeks Bella. after. Mm -hmm. was okay. So it was after, after but, but it was well before Robin was found. And before. again, a week before mm -hmm. Robin was found, but yet it was in a completely different condition as opposed to some of the other things she was wearing. Closer to where Bella was found. Yes. yes. It was, correct. It was, so it followed that it was same a current. Peers down. Um, there were so many theories about that blouse uh, in talking to guys from, from DNR, from Department of Natural Resources, who deal with uh, people that drown in the bay. Um, they talk about the currents that, are, or that, are, that come through the bay. That are, they're, they're so strong, 
sometimes they will rip clothes off and and shoes and things off of of people that are uh that are in the bay for a prolonged period of time um did they were were Wayne and Robin fighting on the pier and did that did he grab it and somehow it gets taken off and then it once it gets taken off it goes back into the bay and maybe maybe floats or just kind of floats down to where it was found um we had so many people giving us an opinion about that um we really don't know um my initial reaction was that it was probably the bay the the current because of how how strong the currents are in that area i mean th- we're not talking about we're in a little tributary um or little stream off off of the bay this is directly in the bay you can see the uh you can see the other side you can see the western shore from their eastern shore home um and in between that you see all those huge ships coming up the channel so it is dire- they are in the bay what do you what do you make of so the blouse the blouse we don't know exactly yeah. but the piece of shirt the t-shirt or whatever it is that that's tied that's wrapped around her hand when she's found what is what is Maryland State Police belief on that is that a shirt that she was wearing under the blouse or is that kind of an unknown factor at this point where it could belong to someone else or she just picked it up along the bottom of the bed no, I th- that I think that was something w- that she wore under the under the blouse um and then all that time in the bay, it probably got torn up, up. Torn, tor- torn up a little bit, and um, and then of course it's it it can't uh, it it got stuck on you know stuck on her wrist and that part that yeah. portion of the of the shirt the shirt yeah. we we talked about this when we we did the case and you know it's something that still to me I think holds a lot of weight which is that shirt that was wrapped around her hand and our viewers will see the picture is torn to shreds it's literally almost unidentifiable and yet the blouse itself is in perfect condition. And I think most people would assume that whatever happened, the blouse came off before she went in the water or immediately after, because there's no way the shirt that was underneath that blouse got that torn up, but yet the blouse sustained no damage whatsoever. It just doesn't make sense. It would have to damage the outer layer before getting to that under layer. So I don't think anybody, whether you're a detective or just somebody who who watches these things, would say, oh, no, it's possible that the shirt underneath could get torn to shreds, but the shirt that she was allegedly wearing on top of it had no damage whatsoever. Well, my, my thing, my theory is that maybe that, that shirt, maybe that blouse came off initially within the, the, the first two days that she was in the water, you know, on the bottom, because she was definitely, you know, once a body goes in and once, once, you, uh, once you drown, you don't float, you, you sink. Um, you don't sink all the way, but at some point you sink to the bottom, and then it, the, that water was very cold. That's why it took so long for her body to be recovered because that water was very cold, and it kept her from decomposing like a person. If a person drowns in the summertime in sixty-eight degree you know, water, they are going to f- come up, float, so to speak, uh, within a couple days. In the winter time, if you have, you know sub zero, you know, temperatures or or you know, freezing temperatures, it's going to take a little while for the body to float up. Uh, that's what because, happened with Lacey Peterson. Yep. Yeah. The same thing. I'm still mm-hmm. I'm still stuck on the blouse with it being not on her body when she entered and the only reason being is we've all had a button-up shirt, you and I did, you know, obviously Stephanie where when you have the shirt on and especially this shirt cuz it from the picture when she was alive it was very tight form fitting. Mm-hmm. If you put a shirt on and you try to take that shirt off, not using your hands and trying to get both arms out of the mm-hmm. sleeves simultaneously. Good luck. I yeah. want to take a video of it because I want to see you do right. it. We need to put you on. We need to make you go viral. Right. So for me to have that shirt come off from the current or from rocks and not sustain any damage because it would take an outside force to help mm-hmm. maneuver it off, which I still don't think would be possible to get her arms out of those sleeves. It would literally have to be a perfect situation where right. one arm comes out. Than the right. other. So it's my belief, and this isn't influenced by you or anyone that that blouse went in the water before or after, or after mm-hmm. she was in the water. It, w- you can come to your own conclusions how that would happen, but that just makes more logical sense to me. Mm-hmm. Yep. Stephanie, did you have anything else? 
I see your head spinning. Her high heels, were they <laughs> were they heels that were strapped on, you know, like little, I don't know, I don't wear high heels, I hate them, but the, the kinds that kind of have this little like strap where you can kind of tighten them? No, they were um, slip on, but it had the, it's those heels that have the elastic band that goes around the, can't remember if it goes around the Achilles or around the top that kind of keeps your heels on. Like it, that's why we were very, at, at some point I was like, well, yeah, she has her heels on still, but those heels had this, this elastic band. And I remember it was kind of a thicker band that kept those heels on. It wasn't like a little strap that you, like a buckle, it was a slip on. And then this, this kind of elastic strap that kind of kept her foot in there. Once, her once she put heels, it in, heels and they uh-huh. were slip ons. They weren't the ones you can tighten, and they were still on. Nope. But the blouse nope. was off. No, the, no. <laughs> the, what I'm saying is the heels had this elastic band that kept yeah, them but still. almost like. Well, where I mean, was her it? Swell, where, where, and her feet swelled. Her, her, her feet, feet probably swelled, swelled yep. almost immediately. Oh, and bloated from the water. Yeah. yeah. So, so almost I, immediately, I never had first... any any problem with the heels being on. You know, of course. On. Other than the fact that why would she why jump, would in, she the jump in the water voluntarily with them on? Yeah. You said the her body, her feet are going to swell almost immediately? Pretty quickly. Water, just like a, like even if you go in the water but and I mean, you're alive. But I mean, not after a couple know, hours, especially if the water's so cold, her feet are going to get... Well, my thing is if she goes in the water and she's either unconscious or, or, or really disoriented, she's not moving much. So she might sink to the bottom and just sit there and not move. And then that's maybe 12... 24, 48 hours where she doesn't move and your water, your body will start to absorb the water around you. And very quickly, you're going to start to, you're going to hate to say it, but you're going to start to kind of absorb that and you, you blow. And then you take into consideration the gases and stuff that takes place over a longer period of time. The minute she enters the water, the process of her feet getting slightly bigger slowly starts to occur. Yeah. Just like if you're, if you're in a pool for a prolonged period of time and your, your hands start to, to prune and things. Your, your yep. skin's going to start to prune, and especially if you are deceased in the water, your 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 skin is going to start to absorb that water. And um, you know, as far as the the heels, I, I don't, you know, like Derek said, I think at some point during her decomposition, she, the, the the feet are going to swell too. But those those um, heels were on very well; like they didn't come off. Um, until we took them off, you know, for, you know, once the, the, uh, medical examiner took them the off. The autopsy. So yeah. she's going to sink. Recovered. She's going to sink. There's not going to be a ton of movement while she's sinking. Right. Bloating from the water. Then by the time she starts moving with the current, when she come, kind of mm-hmm. comes back up and starts floating, yeah. she's Her already swollen to the yeah. point where the shoes. They ain't coming I, off. Like I said, I wish I could, um. Yeah. I wish I could know I, I what wish, shoes I those I could, were. I can't I, even I'm walk in a, heels without them flying off. I am a heel expert. Um, <laughs> don't lie i know derek is me neither but, uh, <laughs> yes not, i am i'm not a heel expert but I, I know that these heels were different from like uh, the little heels where you you, you, you buckle them it had a, a strap that actually kept them on and yeah. once they slipped in they they were they were in we um we're coming to the end of this but i want to just take it full circle because we've talked about facts there's not a lot of opinions going on here maybe more opinions bait from me and stephanie but you're just telling us what you remember of the case and obviously part of your you know process being objective you have to entertain the idea that although there's clear signs of deception from wayne that there is a small possibility that this was a tragic that this was a tragic accident is that is that fair to say it's fair to say i mean uh you know, we have an undetermined death. So any anytime you have an undetermined death, you are going to have, you know, of course, with his, uh, some of his statements and timelines and things like that, we're looking at something that may, may not, may be something that he, um, he was the catalyst for. But like you said, he, maybe he left and she's with Bella and Bella goes, you know, she's an older dog and she goes on to the pier and she falls in. And she and she, everybody that we talked to said that if that dog were to fall in anywhere or need to be rescued, uh, she would be the first person in the water to go rescue that dog. Yeah, so absolutely. that could have happened. Um, it's not the beyond. It's not beyond the realm of possibility. But um, you know, we 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 have Wayne that's that gives us this you know his story and it's some and most things don't add up. 
especially after, yeah. especially from the time that she she arrives, and then you know what his story is as far as what happened after she arrived. Because if it's an accident, why does he lie, right? Right, and then and we're also saying, you know, if it's an accident and he was there, why didn't he call nine one one and say, "Oh my God, my wife just fell off the pier and I can't find her." Um, yep, she went under. The other thing is, okay, let's say he did leave and she was still alive and this happened. That, that I don't believe that at all, but it's not beyond the realm of possibility that something like that could have happened. It's 2013 when this occurs. We're sitting in 2021. You know, where does this case stand now without giving away anything that you're not allowed to say? You know, obviously the case is still open, um, but what would you like our listeners, our viewers to know? As they sit, as they sit here today, where this case stands, it still stands as 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 uh, being a cold case. Uh, it's still undetermined as far as the death investigation is concerned. But if anybody has any information about uh, anything involving this case, and I'm not talking about what you watched on a podcast or a show, I'm talking about information that you've heard f- pretty much from the horse's mouth, or maybe some friends, or family that know this, the whole situation, um, you know, I will always, uh, entertain uh, information. Um, and like I said, I'm not going to entertain information, f- uh, you know, from people reading an article or something like that. But if you Absolutely. have, uh, some, some e- evidence or in this case, we don't have much evidence, but I think it's, it's going to be mostly, uh, things that people hear, uh, about what happened or somebody, or somebody says, says something, yeah, or s- then that would be great. Well, and you know, just to put it out there, as far as everyone's concerned, Wayne is innocent until proven guilty in a court of law, um, then he should be treated as such. So we don't want anybody contacting him, going to his place of work, reaching out to him via phone, text, email. Do not do that. Stephanie and I do not want that happening. I'm sure Sergeant Sexton doesn't want that happening. So please do not contact him in any way, shape or form. He is innocent in the eyes of the law. And that's the way we have to look at it. Uh, Sergeant Sexton, I want to thank you for your time. I appreciate the transparency. We talk about this a lot, Stephanie and I. We don't always agree on it. We talk about law enforcement working with the public in a way that doesn't jeopardize the case, but can still possibly assist because there may be somebody out there, like you said, that can help you in getting to the finish line, whether it's to determine this was an accident or this was something more than that. So I'm sure this is refreshing for Stephanie, right? I mean, from your perspective compared to what we usually get. And I'm sure that our viewers uh, really appreciate this. So thank you for your time. And uh, stay safe out there. Thank you. All right. We're back. So (laughs) let's talk about what we thought. Like, that's a lot of information. What we went through in part one, what we went through the beginning of this part, plus Dave Sexton's interview, which I I was really enlightened about. I'm so glad that he was so open to answering our questions, too, because there were things we went over and there were there were a couple of things that we heard from him that we hadn't heard before such as the mall thing, right? The fact that Robin and Wayne's youngest daughter worked at this mall in Annapolis. Robin also happened to be in that general area, like probably at a restaurant at the mall that night with another gentleman. Wayne's in Annapolis that night. He tells Sexton later that he was bringing his youngest daughter food. She says she never gets the food. But we now are kind of believing that maybe he just said he was there to bring her food to explain why he was in the general area of that mall where Robin, his wife, his estranged wife, happened to be at that time sharing a meal with another man. So that was a very interesting thing that that I hadn't known before. Yeah, it really is. And I didn't know the specific, specifics that it was a mall. I knew that, that he was in town that night, all that good stuff. And again, to be more specific, he basically said, listen, he did have a justifiable reason for being there for a little while. But it appears that he stayed longer. So what we read between the lines is GPS coordinates. Put him there a lot longer. He, they probably talked to people that he had visited that night. Because I guess he went out to dinner first too. And then was supposed to bring Rachel something, his daughter. So they probably corroborated his story with the people initially. Like, hey, yep, we were able to corroborate your story that you were at dinner. But then that dinner ended at this time. And yet your GPS ping kept hitting in that area for an additional hour. And it just so happens... It was right in the area where Robin was. And why is this important, guys? A lot of the true crime people that watch this, you already know what we're hitting at here. It's motive, right? 
if he's going to be pissed off that night, if there's a reason for him to take it that extra step than what he's done in the past, it's the fact that as Stephanie has said multiple times, he said he wanted to maybe work it out. He wanted to maybe go to counseling. And yet here's this woman out on another date when we're not even legally divorced yet. And I could see how that might've put him over the edge. That might've been the thing that finally he said where, you know, if I can't have her, nobody can. Yeah. And the, the fact of the matter is though, his alibi was stupid because not only did he not bring Rachel food, but Sexton said Rachel wasn't even working that night at the mall. Right. So maybe he didn't think they would follow up. Maybe he thought he could explain that away after. But I mean, as as we were talking with Sergeant Sexton, I was notching down the times that that he lied, that Wayne lied. And it was a lot. It was a lot of times. And I think I said it to Sexton at one point, like, you know, this is a lot of times he's being dishonest, like to me right there this is something that shows you are not innocent because an innocent person has no reason to lie about these things, yet you did lie. Maybe he thought, oh, it's going to look creepy. <laughs> Maybe if he's innocent, you know, okay, give him the benefit of the doubt. He's like, oh, I go and stalk my wife this night that she ends up missing and dead, so it's going to look creepy as hell if I say I was there stalking her, so let me give another excuse for why I was there, but then it just makes you look worse because now you lied about why you were there on the on the night she ends up dead right 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 and, and we, what dave say what did he say he said he wants he always wants to lock you in their story yeah so he probably hit him with that question out of nowhere it was like hey what were you doing that night oh it was at dinner yeah but we have you still in there like no preparation for it where it's like yeah but we had you there another hour what happened there and, he, and wayne's got to come up with something fast so he goes with the rachel thing and then within seconds of getting off that phone call dave or, or one of his colleagues are calling rachel and discrediting that 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 alibi. They, they probably literally hung up the phone with Wayne and called Rachel before Wayne even had a chance. And they probably said, hey, uh, your dad brought you food that night? And she goes, no, he, he didn't bring me wasn't food. Wasn't even okay, working that you. night. Wasn't even working yeah. that night, guys. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. And then now Wayne's like, oh man, I just got to own that one. But he didn't really own it. He kind of just like, he had no other reason. He never course corrected and was like, oh yeah, actually that's not why I was there. This is why yeah. I was there. He's got to own that mistake. Mm -hmm. He's got to, like what I'm saying, he's like, at that point, you dug the hole. Now you got to lay in it. It's a loss. And, uh, yeah. you know, we had we had talked a little bit earlier before we were recording. And, and I said, I, I just think that he was trying to find her, you know. And if it's like a mall that I'm familiar with, there's the mall, there's the shopping malls. And then there's like five or six restaurants, you know, and these restaurants will have their own separate entrances and exits aside from the mall. But you can also enter them from the mall. You know, that's kind of the kind of thing. So maybe he didn't know exactly which restaurant she was at but he was driving around maybe he saw her car in the parking lot but he didn't know where she was so he couldn't really verify who who she was with or what she was doing so he's like i'm just going to wait here and see if she leaves and you can see in their cell phone records too that she texts back to him at some point she's like i'm on a job interview what's up and then later she's like oh did you call me like i truly believe at this point he was just like waiting there trying to get some response from her to see where exactly she was and who she was with and as he's sitting there, what's going to happen? He's going to be getting more and more pissed off. He's going to be getting more and more like, I can't believe this woman has me acting this fool. I'm sitting out here in the small parking lot like some, you know, crazy person looking for her. I don't know where she is. I'm wasting my time. Like, I can't believe she's driven me to this because it's not going to be his fault that he's acting creepy. It's her fault for evoking this response in him. And he's just going to get more and more pissed off. And then, like you said to me earlier, they had this conversation. What was it? Almost 13 minute conversation. 13 minutes. Yeah. yeah. As she's driving to his house the night, we don't know what transpired during that conversation. But I can only imagine or theorize that he said something in that conversation that made her feel like she needed to get there quick. And maybe that was his plan. Like, how can I stress this woman out, make her feel like something that's precious to her is in danger? So she has to get here quick because. I truly think that if Wayne Pope is guilty of of doing something to his wife, Robin, it was premeditated. I don't think that it was. Uh, I And I, I don't think that he was like, oh, I'm going to kill her tonight. But I think as time passed, probably leading up to that past week or whatever, he was he was like, I can't do this anymore. Like, I'm so annoyed. Like, I tried to chase her other boyfriend away. He left. He's not messing with her anymore. But she's still not back with me. So now mm -hmm. what can I do? Now what can I do? Obviously, it doesn't matter how many guys I chase away. She just doesn't want to be with me. So like you mm -hmm. said, if I can't have her, nobody can. And that was the yeah. plan.
She he, she could have confirmed that for all we know, they could have had a conversation about the dinner that night and she could have confirmed to him like, yeah, I was out on a date. Wayne, we're not together anymore. And we never will and, be. And that, might, yeah. and that might have been where he was like, okay, all right. Final answer. Know. Final answer. Final answer. All right. Okay, yeah. good to know. Well, I mean, you started just going there. Do we want to dive right into theories yeah. right now? Ladies first? I think so. Well, let's just do it. I think I think my theory has been pretty clear from the start. I do believe that whatever happened to her, if Wayne was responsible, he lured her there using her dog, Bella. I even had talked to you about some theories previously because she gets to his house. He's not answering the door. And Sergeant Sexton said he's done things like that before to her in the past because I didn't know that either. This wasn't the first time that he had asked her to come over. Or she had said that she was going to come over and then he just didn't answer the door. This is his way of exerting control over her treating her like a pawn. He no longer has control of her as a husband or a romantic partner. Like, but how can I still affect her? How can I still like control her with my with my words, with my um, behavior? So he would just have her come over and then not answer the door. And I wonder if he was already outside when she got there and she couldn't find him and he wasn't answering the door. And maybe he was in the back already because their their house butted up right against the water. Right. So maybe he's got Bella out back. And the dog's barking. So she goes around back to see like, oh, I hear my dog back there barking. And he's like holding Bella over the water. And she's like, no. And she runs towards him. And that's when he strikes, throws Bella in, knocks her on the head, pushes her in, walks away. It all goes down within 30 seconds. And that's it. Because there's no sign of struggle inside. They had a team in there. I just feel like this was so well planned and so fast because nobody heard anything. Nobody saw anything. But within, I feel like it would have to be 35, 40 seconds, both Bella and Robin were in that water and he was gone and walking away like nothing happened. Yeah, I think I I, I completely agree with you. I, I agree with your theory. So I'll just add to it because I think a good investigator always tries to disprove their own theory. And you can't with this one because we talk about the idea that Wayne did leave while she was still alive. And, you know, would she have gone for a walk with Bella? It's too cold. She wasn't wearing the proper clothing. If she went inside to get Bella, you would assume she probably would have gone through her mail at that point, picked it up, moved it a little bit, um, done some things before, you know, maybe packed a bag Grabbed of a stuff. Because she had her clothes yeah. there still. She had time yeah. to, no sense of urgency. Grab a coat because you're going mm -hmm. outside with Bella. Um, you know, if Bella does fall in accidentally, you know, the dog's not going to sink immediately. You would have time to take off your heels. And even if you jump in with your heels on and realize I'm not going to be able to get to her, you would be able to swim back to shore. And here's the thing. It's suggestive based on the autopsy that on the meta, on the report from the dog, the dog did make it back to shore. Yeah. She just couldn't get on the rock. So if the dog was able to make it back, more than likely if Robin was alive and well, she would have swam back and got right next to her. She didn't. Um, and then you think about the conversations, you know, if Wayne's plan was to, and I think about my own personal life with people I know who've gotten divorced and have these tumultuous relationships or are in the process of getting divorced. If it's been established that I'm not going to be there when you arrive, if I know you're 15 minutes away and I'm, I'm planning from the start not to be there while you're there per my lawyer's, you know, recommendation, I'm probably going to get in the car 15 minutes before you get there and start heading to my grant, my parents' house or 7-Eleven. Because I don't want to leave when you leave. That defeats the purpose of not seeing you, of seeing you, and not allowing for an allegation to be made against me. Right? You'd want to be gone before your wife or husband get there. That was not the case. He got off the phone with her and got more comfortable and quote unquote fell asleep. So that doesn't really jive with what a commonsensical person would do. That's another red flag. Then we talk about the lies that you know he's been caught in as far as his alibi. Uh, it just doesn't add up. The thing that makes the most sense to explain why he would suddenly decide to leave his home at such a you know late hour of the night, go get a coffee, go pick up a truck after after she arrived, again, in air quotes, it just doesn't make sense. and And to Dave Sexton's point, to think that he fell asleep within fifteen minutes of getting off the phone with her is, again, just from a commonsensical place doesn't make a lot of sense. You're going to be fired up. You're going to be upset. You just heard about, you know, you just found out your wife was down. You're not going to be able to fall asleep, even if you want to. So I think for most people, it just doesn't add up. And I, and I agree with everything you said, as far as how she was killed, how it all went down. I gave some, I, I did hint in the show that maybe there was a struggle inside and he had an opportunity to clean up. The only reason I say 
something might have went on inside is because you said it. I don't know if it was in the recording or after, but you made a point that the, the house next to them, the neighbor, isn't too far away. So just from my own experience, experience living near neighbors, you know, the house is not too far away. When they argue, if they're outside arguing, whether I want to hear it or not, I can. And I would think that if Wayne was out there with Bella, Robin probably would have screamed, please, you know, Wayne, don't do it. You know, what are you doing? Like something that maybe someone would have heard. Now there's a possibility that did happen and no one heard it, but it just, or, to me, the fact that, or go ahead. like he didn't even give her that chance, right? Because maybe he, he's not answering the door, which we know, right? When he okay. said he was yep, asleep I, yes. and then yes. all of a sudden she hears Bella or he's calling like Robin and she walks over and she sees him crouched on the dock and she's like, what? And he's like, Bella's hurt. Come quick. She runs over, goes to look down at Bella, boom, right on the head, pushes her in, throws Bella in, done. That's it. Possible. Because he's got to use Bella as the reason for why Robin may have gone in the water to begin with. Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense why she would even go in the water. Now he can say, maybe she went in after the dog. That's what he said in his interrogation, right? She loved that dog. Everybody will tell you that dog was her baby. If you don't have Bella there, there's absolutely zero reason why Robin would be even near the water. So he needed to use that dog for more than one reason. And there even could have been a a situation where before Robin even came outside or went around back, he already threw Bella in the water and said, hey, you might want to go out back. Your dog's in the water. Like that scratch on his rib, Mm -hmm. he might have threw in there and bed. hey, better go get your dog because she's swimming away right now. And then, you know, as she's like you said, as she's going out there, he's behind her or whatever. As soon as she gets close enough, he renders her unable to, you know, swim back because of whatever happens, Mm -hmm. whatever it was, it was somewhat quiet or Mm -hmm. not loud enough for someone to hear. But I, I think we can both agree on this. We've talked about it. She writes, can I get my mail? Can I get my mail? Wayne never responds to her in text. I think you're under the same belief that the reason he doesn't respond via text is because at some point immediately after that, they do come in contact, physical contact. And, and very shortly after that, whatever went down um, was quick and it didn't happen over a long period of time because of the time window we have. We know it, whatever happened. Um, so I do agree. I think we both are on the same page that, and, and Dave Sexton said this himself, Wayne knows what happened that night, you know, whether it was, and he gave this qualifying answer that, you know, did she fall in the water accidentally and Wayne just didn't do anything to help her? Yeah, that's possible. It's possible. It doesn't Wayne, matter. Uh, that's still criminally responsible for cr- someone's death yep. though. So yep. you're nope. still a murderer so, as far as I'm concerned. We don't know why it happened, but this is why we covered it on Breaking Homicide. This is why we covered it here on Crime Weekly. And um, it's a sad story all the way around so for sure. Just to clarify, like we both believe that Robin was dead in the water before Wayne Pope ever left to go swap his trucks and get his coffee. Yes. Yes. He, in my opinion, that um, hour where he said he was sleeping is when yep. it happened, if it yes. was going to happen. Yes. Right? And, it, you know, that that's the, the we believe again, this may be he may be innocent, but we believe that the reason for him leaving when he did was because whatever happened had already happened. And he realized if I don't leave, there's no window where that unknown person, quote unquote, unknown person could have done this or it could have been an accident, because if even if it was an accident. I would have been here and been able to render aid. Yes. And I mean, so he's got to leave. You all know, like if you have dogs and this is the one thing I couldn't get around with his whole I was sleeping for an hour thing. They had they had Bella there and Robin's not going to just like text him and be like, can I get my mail? She's going to walk up to the door. She's going to knock on the door. She's going to ring the doorbell. Bella would be barking like crazy. That's what dogs do when they hear somebody outside. It's what they're I mean, somebody could walk by three miles from my house and my dog start barking. There's no way that this guy is sleeping in the living room on the couch because he wasn't in his bedroom. He said he fell asleep on the couch in the living room. There's no way he fell asleep on the couch in the living room. Robin's knocking on the door trying to find out where the hell he is. Bella's barking and he's sleeping through that. Sleeping through Robin trying to get in. Sleeping through his phone ringing or his phone getting texts from her. Sleeping through Bella barking because somebody's outside Mm. knocking on the door. There's no way. Yeah. So the whole I fell asleep for an hour thing, that that's a lie. <laughs> so. yeah. And I don't even believe the aspect that Robin fell asleep. I don't think she would fall no. asleep just randomly. No. So that he needs to say that, though, because if she was awake, she would have kept texting him. Mm-hmm. Right. Exactly. Or she would have you know, reached out but, in some so, way. Right. She would have kept texting him like, why aren't you answering? Why aren't you answering? No. What happened was she wrote, can I get my mail? And then he answered. He, he they, they came in contact with each other. But he had to put that in there that, oh. She spontaneously developed a case of narcolepsy as well at the exact same time as me. 
And that's why it took a little while before I left the house. No, it took you a little while to leave the house because you had to make sure you had your ducks in a row before leaving. You had to kind of think about what you were going to do and how you were going to do it before carrying it out. Allegedly. Uh, really interesting case. Allegedly. Yes, of course. Again, we have to say it for legal reasons, guys. I know you get sick of hearing it, but we also would like the show to continue. So we got to, we got to, and it is the truth. He is innocent until proven guilty in the court of law. He may never be charged with anything based on what we know now, but you know, at the end of the day, I think, you know, Dave has said it, we have said it. There's more evidence that suggests something nefarious than this being an accident. That's all we're saying here. I definitely feel like the whole alibi was a lie though. So <laughs> yeah, <I laughs> right mean, from that, the get go, it, it, it's a bad, it's kind of a bad situation for Wayne in, in the right. eyes of everyone who is a brain, right? So take into everything, right? You talked about the polygraph and how you wouldn't take it, but take in the, the lies in the alibi, right. the unwillingness to take the polygraph inconsistencies with what he did that night as far as coming back from 7-Eleven and going to the friend's house within like 10 minutes of like and already knowing she's missing. Um, Following her to that Annapolis he, that night. Right. Being in Annapolis, having this un, this injury on his ribs that he, again, lied about mm -hmm. was not true how he sustained it. And by the way, about the injury, I'm reading all the comments. Stephanie's reading the comments. I see a lot of you people who have experience with Great Danes and other animals that are large of size. Some people actually work in the field. You've all said that injury is very consistent with a dog that's being picked up Flying that doesn't like to be picked mm -hmm. up and kicking away with its hind legs because it's like, what are you doing? I'm a hundred pounds. You never pick me up like this. This is uncomfortable. Wait, Let me you go. don't even like me. Why are you touching me, man? Right. Could have scared it, could have scared her yeah. or whatever. So you guys have all leaned towards that and I'm leaning towards it at well. And that would support the theory that he doesn't have any defensive wounds because whatever happened was it, there was an element of surprise. It happened quick. And she didn't have a chance to defend herself because she didn't see it coming. And I mean, to be fair, how could she see it coming? As far as we know, right. Wayne was verbally abusive, emotionally abusive, but he none of her friends, none of her family have ever said he's physically abusive, nor are there any reports of domestic violence or domestic issues that the police have had to go to. So as Robin, yeah, you know, this guy He's not the nicest guy, but no one thinks that the person you've been married to for 20 plus years is going to kill you out of the blue. No one goes into that thinking. So she's going into it thinking he's a dick. You know, I'm scared to leave my dog with him because I know he would do something to hurt me. But nobody's thinking, oh, you know, he's going to kill me tonight because you've you slept next to this man for 20 years. That's you shouldn't have to think that. So, yeah, there's always going to be an element of surprise there for her because as much of a dick as she knew he was, she never thought, I think, that he would go that far. I don't think anybody this did. point. Well, it's amazing what people will do, you know, when they finally snap, you know, and you, you just never know. That's why you always got to be cautious, you know, not the best idea to go out there. And again, we always try to put a, a pot, you know, a spin or learning something you could take from this. And if you're going through a situation like this with a loved one, regardless of how long you've known them, and Robin did nothing wrong in the situation, she was actually going out there to get a post hole digger, <laughs> her mail, see Bella. She had very good reasons for going out there. Um, but, you know, if you're going through a situation with a loved one, it's better. It's a better choice to bring someone, mm -hmm. not only for the sake of like making sure nothing happens, but also just having someone there as a support system, you know, because it could get hostile. And if, if he does have or she does have any bad intentions, Having another person there, even if they're waiting in the car, is not going to allow them to to carry that out without being caught because you have a unbiased witness there who's going to say, no, that, that's not what happened. So if you can, and maybe in this case, she, she obviously couldn't, try to have someone with you or choose to go at a different time. And I'll tell you this, a lot of people don't know this. Don't be afraid to annoy the police. We do it mm -hmm. all the time. Even if you can't get a friend or family member to come with you, call the local police department and say, hey. I need an officer present to keep the peace. They will, it's their responsibility to show up and be present, whether it's the exchange of children or the, the gathering of clothes. They might tell you, hey, you can go on this particular day at this time, but they will absolutely go. And if they don't, definitely report it to their superiors because it's their responsibility. We do it all the time. So regardless of who you have around you, you can always have someone present in those situations. And I strongly recommend that you do. Yeah. And the other person will try to make you feel guilty about it. You know, they'll be like, oh, you feel you to call the cops. Who gives a Who shit? Cares? Don't, don't worry about Who that cares? person. OK. Who cares? Your safety comes first and foremost. Yeah. And even if it's just your safety, and like your peace of mind where you're not stressed out, you know, don't go to the don't go to these people's houses late at night. Don't go unaccompanied. 
I mean, I would just try, honestly, if it was a Wayne Robin situation, I would try to like avoid contact at all costs. The thing that Robin unfortunately had working against her was that Wayne had her dog. At the end of the day, she didn't give a shit about that male. She didn't care about that pole digger. She cared about Bella. And Wayne knew it, and he knew he could get her to do whatever the hell he wanted using Bella as a pawn. And I think that's exactly what happened, unfortunately, because this is a woman who cared about her dog. And that means she's a good person, because if you care about animals to that extent, you're a good person. And that's sad that that's what that's what kind of led her into the spider's web. Yep. Sucks for the whole family. Sucks for friends and family. Obviously, our thoughts are with Priscilla, Rachel, the rest of the family. Um, we're thinking of you guys. We're hoping it gets solved. You know, we know, and Dave said this, it's going to be a tough one, but nothing's impossible. And we'll throw it down here right below again. It said it, we said it in the interview. Uh, this is Dave Sexton's, uh, email Email, account. Please don't abuse it. Please don't abuse it. But if you have information that might assist in solving this case, Dave wants to hear from you. So there's the, there's the email for that as well. And also Just make sure that, again, we're not taking uh, any of this justice into our own hands. I've seen some passionate response on comments. It's okay to voice your opinion, but leave it at that. Using your words, nothing else. I just got to put that out there. They will, Derek. um, They will. Daddy Derek. You never know. (laughs) It always takes one person. Um, But again, we appreciate it. And also, thank you to uh, Sergeant David Sexton for doing this. Stephanie, you're big on like transparency Mm -hmm. and and, And and being open to... He's open to it. He does. The ego's checked at the door. He's willing to, for anybody, regardless of who you are, if you can assist in this case, he wants to hear from you. So kudos to him. Anything else? Any uh, house cleaning things we got to clean up? Oh, let's talk about uh, the Day Wonders merch because we are running on our last yes. leg for that now. Yes. So I'm wearing the shirt tonight for a good reason. As you guys are seeing this, this is uh, this should the audio should come out on Friday. Knock on wood, the mugs and stickers that have been sold out for a little over a week um are back in stock however this is going to be our last run on the mugs and stickers because we they're they're made to order so as of right now there's about a hundred mugs and stickers left so if you want a day oneers mug i would strongly suggest you do it now you can go over to crimeweeklypodcast.com slash shop again that's going to be right here here's the mug and again We've already sold hundreds of these things and we appreciate your support. They went a lot quicker than we thought they would. Um, but, and the reason we're switching it up is because we're going to try a different company for a different line. It's going to be the undercover pineapple line and Stephanie's super excited about that. So we're going to stop with the mugs. We'll have the t-shirts for a little longer. And then I've heard you guys, I hear where you're coming from. We're going to switch these over to black. Too. I know Stephanie's happy about that. Yeah, so happy. I'm not good with white. So we're going to have all, when we do our um, undercover pineapple merch, my headphones were off for like a minute because I was struggling to get my sweatshirt off. You should have saw her struggling to get the sweatshirt off as I, I was talking. I am over here. It's like our AC's broken. It's a literal heat wave. Like I have been so hot, but <laughs> yes, we're going to have all different colors for the undercover pineapple merch. So I'm super excited because I'm going to pick out all the colors and everything and uh, we're pumped. We're we're pumped to bring it to you and we're pumped to wear it. So thank you guys so much yeah, for being here. Absolutely. Appreciate all the support. You guys have been amazing. The channel is growing faster than we could ever have imagined. We appreciate all the positive comments, the reviews. And if you haven't already, if you're watching this on YouTube, please like, comment, subscribe. It really does. From what Stephanie's telling me, it helps the algorithm. It gets more eyes on our episodes and that's ultimately what we want. We want to spread these cases as far as we can. Because there's a lot of people out there who don't know the Robin Pope cases of the world. So that's the point of this. We're hoping we can help and we're hoping we get some good news down the road. Thank you guys so much. And we will talk to you next week. Bye. Take care.